Okay, welcome back everybody to our second lecture on um, the end times. We've got the recording on. So, any questions um, so far? We just started off chapter 12. I just gave a little, little uh, introduction. Any questions so far? Okay. So, chapter 12, Revelation 12. What we said was, Revelation 12 is still at the middle of the tribulation, right? We're still there. And uh, John is seeing uh, a woman who's clothed with the sun, the moon, the 12 stars. And uh, this woman has given birth to the man child. That's verse two, a child. And there is a dragon, seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems. And this is verse three. And this dragon drew a third of the stars and threw them to the earth. And the dragon was standing before the woman, ready to devour her child as soon as it was born. Verse five. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to the to God and his throne. Revelation 12, verse 5. Who is this dragon? If you look uh, further down in verse uh, 9, it says, you know, that the great dragon, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Right? So here we are seeing. The dragon, there's this woman who gives birth to the man child. And it tells us something about the man child. He is going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And he was caught up to God. So, who could the man child be? Well, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it cannot be the church. Why? Because it's only Jesus, it's about Jesus. That the Bible says, and this is in Revelation 19:15, that He, Jesus, is going to rule the nations with the rod of iron. So that phrase, He will rule the nations with the rod of iron, clearly indicates this man child is Jesus Christ. And He was the one who was caught up to God. About this dragon, it says, verse 4, this dragon drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. That means this dragon, Satan, the devil, took one third of the angels with him to earth when he was cast out of heaven. And seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems is talking about, remember here, seven. Seven is, is, is used figuratively, talking about you know his uh, cunningness, it's talking about his authority and his influence here on earth. Right? Because he had that. So figuratively, Revelation 12, it's talking about the nation of Israel, it's talking about the dragon, it's talking about the man child, Jesus Christ. Is giving us a little bit of history. That means there was a time in time past, this dragon who had a lot of influence, had a lot of cunningness and he took one third of the angels with him and he was cast to the earth he was waiting like it says there in uh, verse 4 end of verse 4 he was waiting to attack um the man the child who was going to be born through the woman that the woman is israel jesus came through the nation of israel he was waiting to destroy the child and we know how the enemy satan tried to destroy jesus Waiting to destroy Jesus, but didn't succeed. This man child was caught up to God. So, verse 6, Revelation 12, verse 6. So, the woman fled in. So, so that is history. So, 12, verse 1 to 5 is giving us a background to all of this. These things have already happened. So, now it's picking up in the middle of the tribulation. Revelation 12, verse 6. The woman fled into the wilderness. 
where she had a place prepared by God, they should feed her there 1260 days. 1260 days is three and a half years. So Revelation 12 6 is back in the middle of the tribulation. Revelation 12 1 to 5 is okay, little background information, history. Okay, this is what actually happened. This is what the dragon did. This is who the woman was. Um, this is the man child, and all, all of that. Revelation 12 1 to 5. Revelation 12 6 is okay. Now we're picking up in the middle of the tribulation. In the middle of the tribulation, what happens? The woman flees into the wilderness. Woman, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, they're running. They're, they're, they're being scattered out of their own land. Why? Because in the middle of the tribulation, the Gentiles are coming into Jerusalem. The Gentiles are taking over. So the Jews are running for their life. And they're going to run into the wilderness where they will be preserved for where God will take care of them for 1,260 days. That is three and a half years. Now, where is this wilderness? Um, this is where if we when we read Daniel chapter 12, we read about Jordan. Jordan. Uh, uh, this is the nation right next to Israel, much like a desert, very quiet sitting there. And so it's very likely because it's mentioned in D Daniel chapter 12, the sons of Ammon and Moab and so on. It's very likely that the desert areas of Jordan will become a place where the Jews will go to hide and God will preserve them. It's very likely because it's mentioned in Daniel 12. So here he says, the woman fled into the wilderness, Revelation 12, 6, most likely running into the desert region of, of Jordan, which is just adjoining Israel. And they will be preserved there for three and a half years. But this... Uh, but Satan is going to go after them through using the beast and the false prophet. He's going to go after them. We, we'll see that later. So now, Revelation 12, 7 through 11, we see that this dragon is making one last attempt to get into heaven so there's a war in the heavenlies so that's described there in revelation 12 7 to 11 and this he's trying to get in there but michael and the archangels push him back to the earth saying hey no entrance in heaven and it says here that uh, the, the accuser of the brother this is satan verse 12 the devil end of verse 12 the devil has come down to you now, uh, having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. So he, is, he makes a one last attempt to get, get into heaven. Sorry, no way. The Michael and his angels are saying they cast him down. He's cast to the earth. And he says he comes with great vengeance because he knows his time is short. So that's happening in the spiritual realm. Then back to the natural realm, verse 13. When the dragon saw that he'd been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Who's the woman? Israel, the Jews. So he's the dragon, Satan, is going to go after the Jewish people. But verse 14, the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. She said she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she's nourished for a time, times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Time is one times two half a time so one plus two that is three and a half three and a half years so for the next three and a half years the serpent is going to go after the jewish people right and then it describes what he's going to do verse 15 the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood and after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood so we can interpret the flood as as talking about peoples this is going to cause peoples to come against the woman the reason we can interpret flood is as peoples is because later on we'll see in revelation 17 that waters represents people right nations 
So here, so that he's going to spew. That means he's, he's he's moving people against the Jewish people, of Israel. Uh, but God is divinely protecting them. Verse seventeen: uh, the dragon was enraged with the woman. He went to make war with the rest of her offspring who kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It means he's going to try to destroy the Jews as well as anybody else who is keeping the commandments of God, the rest of her offspring, everyone else who are keeping the test commandments of God and who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I mean, Satan is, I'm going to go after the, this, this, this nation of Israel, I'm going to go after the Jews, I'm going to go after anybody who has a testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to point out that phrase, the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's again another indication of the presence and work of the Holy Spirit. Because the testimony of Jesus Christ, what is it? Uh, when, you know, when in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3, the testimony of Jesus Christ is this is what Jesus is saying. The testimony of Jesus simply means this is what Jesus is speaking. He's what he's saying right now. But you see in Revelation 19.10 that it says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That means the Holy Spirit, the spirit of prophecy, is the one who helps us speak the testimony of Jesus. So the testimony of Jesus, that is what Jesus is saying right now, how can we have the testimony of Jesus? Through the spirit of prophecy. Because it's the spirit of prophecy, the Holy Spirit, who helps us speak what Jesus is saying right now. So, once again, this phrase, the testimony of Jesus Christ, in, uh, in, uh, in Revelation 12, 17, is indicating that there are people on the earth who, are, who have the Holy Spirit. They're born again, and they are saying what Jesus is saying on the earth during that time and the dragon Satan is going after such people so Revelation 12 the focus of this chapter Revelation 12 is telling us that starting from the middle of the tribulation for the next 1260 days or three and a half years or 42 months or time times and half a time for that entire duration Satan is going after Israel and anybody else who keeps the commandments of God and who has the testimony of Jesus Christ. Once again, chapter 12 gives us a little bit of history, what happened in the past. There was the woman, the nation of Israel, who gave birth to the man-child, Jesus Christ. Satan was waiting to kill, but he couldn't kill the man-child. This man child was going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. He went up to heaven. So Satan couldn't kill him, couldn't keep him down. So he's very angry. And then in the middle of the tribulation, he's going to go after this woman, which is the nation of Israel, in the natural. In the spiritual, he's going to make his one last attempt to get into heaven. But the angelic hosts, they're not going to let him. They're going to push him and his demonic hosts back to the earth. He's going to come back to the earth with great anger, knowing his time is short. He's got just three and a half years left. And in that time, he's going to go with full vengeance against Israel and against those who keep the commandments of God and who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. But God is going to supernaturally protect the Jewish people, preserve them during this time, and uh, he's going to give them a way of escape. So that is chapter 12. But again, chapter 12 is telling us what is going to happen for three and a half years with the people of Israel and with those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Are you all with me so far? Yes, Pastor. Yes, Pastor. Okay. Yes, all right. Okay. So. Now we get into chapter 13. So now we are moving in the second half of the tribulation. Okay. First half of tribulation is over. 
chapters 11 and chapter 12 are really telling us, hey, these are things that are going to start from the middle of the tribulation and will be happening for the next three and a half years. Now, they're going to start moving along. Chapter 13 is where we start reading about the beast. Remember, the beast was, uh, that, that, that word, the beast, came to us in Revelation 11, verse 7. Suddenly it said, there's a beast, right? Who is this beast? Okay, chapter 13. Now, the language, the language of chapter 13, beginning, is very much parallel to the language used in Daniel, in the book of Daniel. Okay, so if we understand Daniel's, you know, visions, uh, which we will do in the third year, we will study all of that in detail. We will see that the same thing is being used here uh, in what John is seeing in his vision. So John is seeing a beast coming out of the sea. The sea in the Bible represents nations. So he's coming out of one of the nations, right? A beast. He's got seven, uh, I, I'm in Revelation 13, verse 1, right now. He's seeing this beast coming out of the sea. And this beast has seven heads, ten horns, and crowns on his horns. Now, you will see that uh, this is exactly what was also described about the dragon in Revelation 12, verse 3. So this beast of Revelation 13, 1, is like, is the human expression of this dragon which is Satan, right? So in Revelation 12, verse 3, there was this dragon, and we know from Revelation 12, 9, that dragon is the devil, Satan. This beast was coming out of the, you know, out of the, the sea, representing out of one of those nations. He's the earthly replica. He's the Antichrist. He's the dragon's representative on the earth. Now, verse 2 says that this beast was like a leopard, it was like a bear, and the mouth like a lion, and the dragon gave him power, his throne, and great authority. Now, very interesting. Leopard, bear, lion, these are pictures uh, we see in, in, in Daniel's vision. In Daniel chapter 7, there he saw a bear, a leopard, a lion. So these, in Daniel's vision, you can we can understand from there that uh, these were representing different world empires. So there was Nebuchadnezzar empire. Then there was the bear, uh, which represented the Medes and the Persians. Then there was a leopard, which represented the Greeks, and then there was the uh, the lion. Sorry, the, the lion actually came first. The lion, the bear, and the leopard. The Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians, and then the Greeks. This is in Daniel chapter seven. Okay. The point is, what God had informed Daniel. is that from the Greek Empire, the Greek Empire, the first person there was, the first emperor or the ruler there was Alexander the Great. So God had revealed to Daniel in Daniel chapter 8 that from the Greek Empire, after Alexander the Great died, the first horn representing Alexander the Great, after he died, his empire would be divided into four parts, which actually happened. Alexander the Great, his empire grew very powerfully, but then he died young, he died suddenly. And after he died, four of his generals took over four parts of his empire. 
And God revealed to Daniel in Daniel chapter 8 that from one of these four regions will come the little horn that is the Antichrist. So that's why Revelation 12 2 is very interesting. So it's correctly saying, hey, this beast, okay, that means this Antichrist who is coming. He's coming from one of those areas. He, you know, he, the origins are there. There was a Babylonian, the lion. There was the bear, that's the Medes and the Persians. Then there was a leopard, which represents the Greek. So he's got that, that ancestry, that background. And now he's coming. So it is interesting to study Daniel 8, where God told Daniel, this is where the Antichrist will come from from one of the four areas where the Greek Empire was broken into. And very broadly speaking, and I'm not saying these are exact, because uh, the, the regions extended beyond these countries, but some of the main countries that were part of the four, Greek, Syria, Turkey, and Egypt, broad regions. So, so we look at Greek and the surrounding countries, we look at Turkey. Of course, Turkey is in the news these days because of the uh, earthquake. Look at Syria, neighboring country, that region around there, and Egypt, northern Africa. So the Greek empire of Alexander the Great was broken into these four regions, big, big areas. I'm just mentioning the main countries. But God told Daniel in Daniel chapter 8 that from one of these four regions, the Antichrist will emerge. And here we're seeing Revelation 13 too. Hey, same thing. He was like this. He's coming from there. But his authority is given to him by the dragon, this man. And what we see here is this, that Revelation 13, Okay, let me just skip a few. Let me just uh, uh, point out a few things here. Verse 5 says that this beast is going to speak blasphemous things and he's going to do this for 42 months. So, once again, the time period is given Revelation 13 5, 42 months. That means three and a half years. That means what Revelation 13 is talking about is starting in the middle of the tribulation and going till the end of the tribulation. Right? 42 months time period is given. That means second half of tribulation. So it's very interesting. Chapter 11, talking about 42 months. Chapter 12, 42 months. Chapter 13, 42 months. So this beast, this is the Antichrist. Now remember, in Revelation 6 verse 2, we saw this man coming, riding on a white horse. He came as a man of peace. Now the same man is being called the beast the Antichrist. So he comes as a man of peace, now he's the beast, being empowered. He of course was empowered by demonic powers from the very beginning, but now his true colors are coming out. And the other thing is this, what does he do? Well, he's, he's going to be, verse, verse 4, Revelation 24, he wants to be worshipped. And when people worship the beast, they're actually worshiping the dragon. Verse 4. Verse 5. He's going to speak blasphemous things against God. Verse 6. He opens his, blas his blasphemy against God. Now, these things were spoken to Daniel also. So when you go back and read Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, it's exactly what that Antichrist will do, that little horn. He's going to speak blasphemies against God, against um, the Most High God, against Jesus Christ. So that's exactly what it's, it's this beast is doing. That's how we can connect the two, that this beast here is, is the little horn spoken of by Daniel. So he's going to speak blasphemous things. And verse 7, 13 verse 7, he's going to make war with the saints. He's going to go attack the people who um, uh, who worship Jesus. And verse 8, All who dwell on the earth 
whose names are not written in the book of life, they're going to worship him. So that means he's going to get people to worship, pledge allegiance to him. Right? And if people don't refuse, people refuse to worship him. What will happen? Verse ten, Revelation thirteen ten. He's going to kill them. He's going to destroy them. So, Revelation thirteen one to ten is describing some of these activities of this beast, this antichrist, who is empowered by the dragon. Very interesting is verse eleven says there was another beast. Okay, so this beast is like a lamb and and spoke like a dragon. He is like a lamb. So he is a religious leader. We'll see more about this. Right? He is a religious leader. And what does he do? He was 12, Revelation 13, 12. He causes people to worship the beast. Now remember, when they worship the beast, they're actually worshiping the dragon. They're actually worshiping Satan. Now this another beast, whom we call as a false prophet, later on the Bible calls him as a false prophet in Revelation 16, he is causing people to worship the beast. And verse 13 and 14, what does he do? He's doing miracles. He's doing signs and wonders, doing great signs. And he is deceiving those who dwell on the earth. So you can imagine now, try to picture this. God has his two witnesses in Jerusalem. They are doing signs and wonders. They are causing fire to come down from heaven. They are doing the works of God. Satan is having his two people, the, the beast and the false prophet. And the false prophet is also doing signs and wonders on the earth. Same time, during the second half of the tribulation. You can imagine how confused people will be. Because God's got his two witnesses. They are preaching Jesus and they are doing the two you know, signs and wonders. But Satan's got the Antichrist, the beast, and the second beast or the false prophet. They are also doing things. People are going to be so confused. Whom should we follow? Right? Because it says here, he deceives, verse 14, he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs. So by the supernatural, he's going to deceive people. People will be very confused who to follow. And, and it says here, the, uh, the beast, who was wounded by the sword and lived so um, end of verse 14 he, the, the the first beast uh, so it seems like and I, I missed this out here in verse 13 revelation 13 verse 3 also it seems like there was an assassination attempt on the antichrist revelation 13 3 and 13 14 but he lived. So people are marveling. Marvel, oh, this man cannot be killed. He survived. So all the more. And verse 15, Revelation 13, 15. Um, there was uh, an uh, there was so this man creates an image of the beast. And through this image, he is you know, he's causing people to worship this image. Um, this image has the power to kill people. So, you know, how this is going to happen, we don't know. But it could happen through the use of technology. I'm not saying that's the only way it's going to happen. It could happen that way. That this kind of image is distributed all over the world and people are forced to worship it and they don't. You know, something can happen through, through to them, through the use of technology. And then we see verses 16 through 18, something more. That together, the beast and the false prophet, they set up a global economic system. So there is a, a world religious system that is in place where people are forced to worship the image of the beast. 
thereby worshipping the beast and thereby worshipping the dragon, Satan. So that's a world religious system. He's causing people to worship the image of the beast. But now in verse 16 and through 18, we are seeing a world economic system, a financial system. That means you cannot buy or sell until you have the mark of the beast. And if you refuse the mark of the beast, you'll be killed. You cannot participate in fin any financial transaction. So, two ways the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to operate. They're going to operate through a world religious system. You have to worship the image of the beast. They're going to operate through a world economic or financial system. You have to receive the mark of the beast if you want to buy and sell. That means you want to transact, you've got to do this. And every person must have the mark of the beast, the hand over the forehead, if they want to buy and sell. Again, this is possible through the use of technology today. Right? That, you know, there's so many ways to that it could be done. I'm not saying. You know, we have to find out exactly how it's going to happen. But we know today, you know, you can use fingerprinting, you can use retina, uh, check your retina, you can so many things. You, you can put mark here on the body, whatever, so many ways. But through the use of technology, your ability to transact is being controlled. And it is global. It's not localized to one particular country. It's global. So Revelation 13 is giving us this idea that this Antichrist and this false prophet are going to use a religious system and a financial system to control people. And these are the two big things in the world today. Of course, there may be other things, but these are two big things to control people. Revelation 13 brings it out for us. Any questions on Revelation 13? Okay. You all with me? Uh, is it getting too heavy? Can we continue? Is it okay? Yes, please do. We can continue. Okay. Heavy, but we can continue faster. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. So, now we come to chapter 14. In chapter 14, something is happening. Remember in chapter 7, we said God had 144 Jewish servants. 144 Jewish servants who were serving him. They've been marked with the Holy Spirit in the name of the Lord. They're serving God. In chapter 14, John sees something. He sees these 144,000 Jews in heaven and they are worshipping God. So that means at some point in the second half of the tribulation, remember Revelation 7 was in the first half of the tribulation. They started their work. At some point in the second half of the tribulation, these 144,000 Jews are in heaven. Now, the Bible is not telling us clearly how these 144,000 Jews went to heaven. Were they all martyred and killed and therefore their spirits are up in heaven? Or were they just raptured? Did God just rapture them and take them up into heaven? You know, give them resurrected bodies and take them up into heaven? We don't know for sure. But there is a clue in verse 4 of uh, um, verse 3 and 4. In verse 3, it says, you know, the 144,000 Jews, end of verse 3, they were redeemed from the earth. So God took them out of the earth. And then end of verse 4, Revelation 14, 4, it says, they were redeemed from among men and became first fruits to God and to the Lamb. They became 
first fruits to God and to the Lamb. So, this is only a clue. I'm not saying, you know, we can say this like, okay, 100% sure. Because the la last part of that verse is saying, they became first fruits to God and to the Lamb. That word first fruits is important, right? It's not just simply used. It's important. And the word first fruits is uh, used in scripture to talk about either people who were born again spiritually, their first fruits, the first people to be saved from, in say, in amongst a certain community. It's also used to talk about resurrection from the dead. Resurrection. So, we, if we, and again, I'm not saying this is 100% sure, but if we take up that word first fruits and say, okay, may, this word first fruits here in Revelation 14.4, should mean something because God is saying they are first fruits to God and to the Lamb. What would this mean if, if uh, it probably, if you put it in line with First Corinthians fifteen about Jesus being the first fruits from the dead? Okay, so maybe these are the first set of people who died in the resurrection in, in the tribulation who are being raised. Up. And that means they are being resurrected with their glorified bodies. Could mean that. And I'm not saying for certain because we don't know. I'm just trying to explain based on that word first fruits. That most likely these people were killed, but God raised them up, gave them glorified bodies. So maybe they were not killed, but God just gave them glorified bodies, took them into heaven. So the main idea is getting resurrected bodies, first fruits. So maybe these 144,000 Jews didn't die, but God raptured them, gave them glorified bodies, took them up into heaven. And so they are called first fruits because they were the first set of people from the tribulation to receive their glorified bodies. Maybe. Right? So uh, I'm not saying this for sure. I'm just saying it that because in Revelation 14, John is seeing them in heaven. How did they get there? Um, something must have happened. Either they died and came, or God just raptured them, changed their bodies, and took them. You know. So uh, based on that word, first fruits, most likely they were just raptured and taken to heaven. Then what happens? In the rest of chapter 14, John is hearing uh, announcements being made. And this is very important because there's an angel in verse 6. So that in chapter 14, uh, angels are making announcements. Right? So there's an angel. He's announcing, this is 14 verse 6. He's making an announcement. He's announcing the everlasting gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So there's an angel. God is using an angel to announce the everlasting gospel to people all over the world. Just keep that thought in mind. I'll mention we'll just mention what the angels are doing and then we'll talk about it. Then chapter verse 8, Revelation 14, 8, there's another angel. And this angel is announcing something. This angel is saying, is announcing the fall of Babylon. He's saying, Babylon is fallen. Babylon is fallen. So there's another angel announcing to all the people the fall of Babylon. What is Babylon? We will see in chapter 18. We will see in chapter 18 that Babylon 
is referring to the world financial system. So remember in chapter 13, the beast and the false prophet, they set up a world financial system. You cannot buy or sell unless you have the mark of the beast. This angel is saying, Babylon is going to fall. Babylon has fallen. Babylon has fallen. Warning the people, Babylon has fallen. This financial system is coming down. We will see it in chapter 18. Okay. But he's using the word Babylon. There's a reason. Uh, chapter 18 explains it. But this angel is saying, Babylon has fallen. The financial system is going to fall. Third angel, verse 9. There's another angel. This angel is saying, basically, he's warning people don't receive the mark of the beast, don't worship the image of the beast. So there's another angel, third angel, warning people, don't receive the mark of the beast. Don't worship the image of the beast. Then there is a fourth angel, verse 15, Revelation 14, verse 15. The fourth angel is announcing, saying, God, put in the sickle, for the harvest is come. Sorry, put in the sickle because the harvest has come. The harvest will come. Now, harvest, sickle and harvest is a picture of souls being saved. So this angel is just announcing, God, you know, put in the sickle, harvest is coming, meaning there's going to be a great harvest of souls. Fifth angel, that's Revelation 14, 14, 17, is saying, he also has a sickle, but he is saying, the grapes are ready to be crushed in the wine press. So that wine press and grapes being crushed is representing the wrath of God. It's like grapes crushed, no? the crushing the, of the grapes. That's a picture of the wrath of God. And verse 20, Revelation 14 20 says, When the wine press is crushed, what will happen? Blood. Came out of the wine press. That means blood, because of this pouring out of wrath, God's judgment, blood came out of the wine press up to the horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs, which is 184 miles outside the city, city of Jerusalem. So the fifth angel is saying, is announcing, judgment is going to come. The wine press, being, the grapes being crushed in the wine press, is a picture of judgment. The judgment is going to come outside the city of Jerusalem, and blood is going to flow high as a horse's bridle. It means five feet high. It's going to flow for 184 miles. So imagine how great that judgment is going to be. Blood is going to flow for about 184 miles high, as high as a horse's bridle. So if somebody's sitting on a horse from the ground to the bridle, it's like about you know four or five feet or something like that. So much blood is going to flow outside the city of Jerusalem. So in chapter 14, what do we see? We see that somewhere after the middle of the tribulation, the 144,000 Jews are taken out of the earth. They're in heaven. And then there are five angels making announcements. Each angel is announcing something. First, there's an angel telling people, uh, preaching the gospel, the everlasting gospel. Second, there's an, another angel saying, Babylon, the world economic system, is going to fall. Third, angel is saying, don't worship the image of the beast. Don't receive the mark of the beast. Fourth angel is saying, there's going to be a great harvest of souls. Fifth angel is saying, there's going to be a great judgment coming. The announcements are being made. So, now the question is, Who are these angels? How is it going to be happening? How are these angels going to be making their announcements? Uh, we don't know those details. So, you know, uh, some people, I'm just mentioning this, but some people may are thinking, or they would write, you know, oh, these angels are these satellites that are preaching the gospel all around the world. Uh, maybe that's what, uh, John is 
thinking that these satellites are traveling all around the world and the gospel is being preached and people are you know people are preaching and uh, through the use of these satellites the message is coming all over the world uh, uh, you know uh, some people would interpret it like that that means during the tribulation uh, in revelation 14 there are people who are preaching uh, but through the use of satellites, they're covering the globe and they're warning people these four things. The everlasting gospel is being preached. They're warning people not to receive the mark of the beast or worship the image of the beast. They're warning people that uh, the economic system is going to fall. Uh, they're warning people um, that, uh, uh, that you know, there's going to be this great harvest of souls. There's going to be this great judgment coming. Uh, so some people, may interpret it like that now maybe we don't know so we can't uh, prove them wrong uh, and one of their main arguments is that god has commissioned people to preach the gospel not angels right so which is a very valid argument so maybe that's how it's going to happen or if god wants to use angels actually angelic beings to do this so be it you know we don't know john says he saw the angel so um, uh, we know that the commission to preach the gospel has been given to man but we also know that god has used angels to bring messages to people he has used angels to bring announcements to people you know both in the old and the new testament so um, there's no reason why he won't do it again Right. So I, I'm just mentioning that that one, we could take it literally that there are going to be angelic beings doing this, or if you take it figuratively, then some people interpret it like that. That it's actually people who are proclaiming, but they're doing it to the whole world using satellite technology and so on and so forth. So we don't, you know, have I would just leave it as angels. God has used angels in the past, so he can use angels again. How exactly are these angels going to communicate to man? Uh, we don't know. Uh, we'll just leave it to God to decide. But the main point is this, that during the tribulation, the second half of the tribulation, people all over the world are going to be warned about these five things. That means nobody is without excuse. They're going to hear the gospel. They are going to be warned about the financial system. They are going to be warned about the religious system. They are going to be in, and you know that there's going to be a great harvest of souls. That announcement is going to be made. They are also going to be told that there's going to be great judgment coming. So that's going to happen. Okay. So we'll stop here for today. I hope um, you are following me in this journey through Revelation. These are the things that are going to be happening. Any questions? OK. All right. So let's pray together. We will pick this up next week from uh, chapter 15 onwards. I will take it forward, OK? Uh, could somebody please close in prayer and then we will dismiss. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for the day. We thank you for the beautiful class that we have. God, as we are listening to the classes, help us to understand your deep truths about uh, what is going to happen in this life. We thank you that you are a God who speaks and we thank you that you are a God who wants us to know these things, Jesus. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word, Lord. God, you are coming back again. And God, I pray that we will uh, guard our souls, guard our hearts, and we will proclaim this gospel boldly to the people because you are a living God and God, you are coming back for your people, mm -hmm. Jesus. Be with us, guide us, fill us with your truth, fill us with your knowledge. And do mighty works through us, Lord. We have to live for your glory. 
Amen. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will dismiss now. See you again soon. God bless. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.